Hey guys, we're diving into Gordon Kaplan part two. This is arguably one of the best interviews we've ever done. Most important interviews. How can I possibly say that after five years and 700 interviews? Here's the deal. This guy was top of his game, higher than many of us would ever achieve. Chairman of his law firm, number one deal maker in the United States, family, perfect, best college, incredible at sports. This guy checked every box, but he stepped over the line. During that Varsity Blues scandal we've all heard about, he paid someone to change test results. Ends up losing his law firm, goes to jail. Oh my God, you gotta listen to part one. Like, I can't even imagine. Here's somebody who knew right from wrong and he made a mistake because you would do anything for your child. So please listen to that. But in part two, what we're gonna dive into is um, what happens when you lose everything, what happens when you disappoint your entire family, your children, your friends, your friends stop talking to you. They want to distance themselves from you. You lose your law firm. You lose your money. You go to jail. How do you bounce back from that? Most people don't. Most people can't. But there's some clues here. If we listen very intensely that we can apply to our own lives because we're all going to face, you know, speed bumps, roadblocks, uh, if you do Spartan races, you're going you're gonna to face some real obstacles. And maybe with those clues, it'll help us get through those valleys of death in our life. Help us bounce back because this guy's coming back. And, and I don't know how the hell he's doing it, but he's doing it. And so listen in, enjoy this, and let's learn. Welcome to the Spartan Up podcast with Joe DeSena, founder and CEO of Spartan Race. We are talking about overcoming obstacles. The same way we teach people to get over obstacles on the course, we will teach you here on the Spartan Up podcast to get over obstacles in your mind. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Duralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. You can see full prescribing information at Duralane.com. You went completely backwards. Here you are looking to remove an impediment using your words. You now end up in a situation I can't even imagine, and I don't think anybody listening or watching could imagine the uh, the impact it has on your relationship with your daughter. And yep. then, and then does it does it set her ten years back? Yep. Yep. Right. And you were looking to put her ten years forward. Well, I I, I wasn't. I, believe me, I wasn't looking to put her 10 years forward or 10 minutes forward i was looking at a very specific issue and dealing with it in a way that i frankly thought was dealt with a lot um doesn't make it right excuse doesn't make it right at all and it doesn't matter how many times people do corrupt things look what compounds it is i was a lawyer and i was a lawyer at the very top end i was co-chairman of a major law firm had a massive practice, loved what I did, transactional work, and I knew better. I knew much better. There's no excuse for this. And it damaged my daughter. She had, she didn't need it. She didn't want it. She didn't ask for it. She didn't know that it it had any of it going on. And she gets subjected to this. And it took me a while to figure this out. But to your question, and to my earlier point, is this is how I know maybe in a way I was successful in raising a good kid because I called her right as I got out of out on bail. I was in a courthouse in a pri- in a jail cell in, a, in the courthouse. She was my first or second call right afterwards. She went into hiding and I called her on her cell and I'm crying and I said, "Sweetheart, I I'm so sorry. I'm crying." And she said to me, Dad, it's okay. It's not your fault. It was my fault. But her first instinct was to make me feel better. Sorry. That's when I knew, in retrospect, that I had done a good job with that kid. You got a winner. You got a winner. Um, I screwed up. She did. 
And relationships rock solid now? I think it's better than it was before. Well, before um, you, you now were, she you, does it. That doesn't mean she forgives me for forg- forgiveness is a big word. It, she knows what I did was wrong. She hates the fact that I did it. She doesn't want any part of it. Um, but I can talk to her much more openly now. And there's something there's something freeing in a way in failure. Uh, and I failed miserably, and I had never failed in front of them, in front of my children before, uh, not to any level that they would really recognize. I'm sure I did, but not in a way that they would recognize. And I failed miserably. Um, Does it affect her, uh, her college going forward? God willing, hope not. Yeah. But uh, I would imagine she's strong. I mean, I don't, I don't know her, but she, I would imagine she's stronger from this whole thing. I think she is. Right? You, you wouldn't wish it on anybody, but, but I, I, I bet you she's all the better for it. She's certainly not the better. No one's the better for this mess, this disgusting mess I put myself and my family into. Uh, but she is stronger. Do you think, Gordon, that you and, and all the other parents... Uh, come across to these children as like, hey, you didn't have confidence yes. in me. Yes, there's no way around that. And what that that's absolutely true, and it does come across that way. But what it really is is those parents, as high achieving as all of them were, we're talking about award winning actors. We're talking about uh, uh, people who ran major companies, including one of the biggest bond managers, if not the largest bond manager in the world. Um, uh, uh, very uh, accomplished people, most of whom did not grow up wealthy, right? Who built careers and a lot of success. They didn't have confidence. I didn't have confidence in myself. And that projected on my kid. Right. I should have had confidence in her. She deserved my confidence. That was my lack of confidence. Your, yeah, your, your weakness was you were looking to patch something up in your own weakness um, yeah. By having a, a perceived um, more successful kid in your own mind, like whatever it was, it was going to yeah. help you. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, and, and it's uh, separating these things out. And again, it's taken a lot of meditation and a lot of thinking and uh, a, a lot of time and uh, be honest with it, therapy uh, to get that through. Because your initial reaction is, oh, I did this for my kid. That's bullshit. You did it because of your own insecurities, because of your own problems, because of your own need for whatever that is of having um, your child be deemed successful within some sort of bullshit what, what, world. Um, there's going to be a movie out with Will Smith um, portraying um, the Williams sisters yep. and, and uh, King Richard, I think they call it. Yep. And I haven't seen it. But I would imagine it's it's uh, you know the Tiger Woods dad story, yep. the, right? Like where they're just bulldozing. I mean, they're making the kids work hard, obviously, yeah. but 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 pulling any string they can anywhere to get. Yep. You know, so when it when is it okay? You, when you not when you don't get caught, is it okay? Like, I, uh, look, I think we we all know right from wrong, and it's not okay if you know it's not okay. You start there, and I knew it wasn't okay. Right. So I crossed that line. It's not like... So push hard. And we did. Right. And I, I, we weren't uh, uh, like Richard Williams, uh, not pushing that hard, or um, Andre, uh, Andre Agassi's father. I mean, he wrote an incredible book. Andre Agassi wrote an incredible book about just this uh, and it, how it changed his relationship with his family and his father in particular, uh, which I read when my daughter was coming up in the same sport. And we thought about that as a family um she was an unbelievable talent from what we saw i mean there was no one else in my family who you know most of us could barely catch a ball right she was just extraordinary still is and it creates an enormous impetus to push and push and push and push and then people are offering you stuff which and you pick from a platter of things and I picked one that was over the line um, 
from a whole host of things that were over the line. I, w- I wonder how we would feel if we were listening or watching right now and, and somebody had picked from that platter that was from a really, really shitty neighborhood. Maybe one parent. Uh, you know what I mean? But how would we feel as the public? Like, well, they kind of... They so could use- I, uh, I started as part of my sort of thinking through all this, like a lot of people who got in trouble, I started writing almost the day after. I just started writing down all my thoughts into what I thought was going to be a semblance of a book. I don't think I'll ever publish anything. but And I, I researched this issue. And the reality is this... This is not socioeconomic. This is parental. So there are magnet schools all over the country, public magnet schools. And there is a huge issue in public schools and these magnet schools of people faking their addresses so that they can get into the magnet schools based on geography. Most of those people are at the lower end of the socioeconomic um, spectrum this is it's this has been portrayed as a crime of the rich and elite and access and it was that but it what it really i think ultimately is it's a societal crime related to um parents needs with respect to something that's in short supply and what's in short supply is the mandate that certain schools or the imprimatur that certain schools give to children and college-age kids. And it's rife throughout education. This is not just 57 rich parents. There's a reason why Rick Singer was in business for two decades doing this stuff. There's a reason why the colleges that he was doing it with for two decades never did anything about it, even though some of them were investigating him for years. This is, this is not purely about rich parents. Isn't now, it? that doesn't make... It, it, that doesn't lessen anything that I did. No, no, no. You made a mistake, and you recognize it. It, it wasn't a mistake. It, it, calling it a mistake lets me off the hook, I think. I ruined my freaking life and almost ruined the life of my... Well, we're, no, I'm going to get there because we haven't kid. set up yet. Like, you, you mentioned it, but we haven't set up yet where you fell from. It was like a 80,000-foot drop. Um, so I want to get there. But, but well, how would you change, knowing what you know now, all the writing, everything you've been through, if you could snap your fingers and change the way we work as, as a country, as a society, as, as a bunch of parents, how, how would you set it up so that... This exists less. This problem exists less? Yeah, that, that, you know, we're not all racing to 40 slots that, that, that exist at some school, and then that's the way you get the best job. And how, how would you restructure things? I'm not smart enough to really answer that question with a full plan. What I would say is, in, in diagnosing the problem, you have something that is in very high demand, right? Very, very high demand, as in high demand is practically anything else, which is the imprimatur from a, quote, great school. Because the studies show you have that, a diploma from a great school, your chances in life, success in life, far exceed people who don't have those same types of opportunities. doesn't mean you will succeed, but you have, statistically, it, it translates well. It's in very short supply. There's enormous amounts of money in the system. That money is subsidized by tax dollars, right? Contributions are made to universities and colleges. That's a tax write-off. So it's subsidized by the government. So you have something in very short supply, huge amounts of money running or, uh, floating around, subsidized, and massive demand, like in unquenchable demand. How do you change that to avoid what is going to happen any time you have that, which is malfeasance? You're going to have it. People are going to cheat. And people are going to cheat when they get there. It's a great do it's you, a, it's do a you great change it? Do you change it by criminalizing it? Is that going to change it? If anybody really thinks that this case 
is going to change the way college admissions work or college contributions work or have college counselors work. From what I can see, and I have been following it, I don't think that's going to happen at all. I think actually it's just going to make it burrow in more and cover it in more layers. Well, I mean, I grew, I grew up in a neighborhood full of organized crime, and you could kill kill a few guys or, or put them in jail, but then somebody else rolls up. Yep. Or think about, uh, you know, Colombian drug lords or whatever, kill yep. a few guys. And whenever there's, whenever there's tremendous demand, big money, uh, it doesn't go away. Yeah. So the best thing you could do is create better education for everybody and let people come up on their merits and not have look I think I've taken a lot of standardized tests in my life including um, the SATs and then the LSATs and the bar exam and all sorts of stuff right there's a place for it but making it a criteria a fundamental criteria at a number cutoff um, makes very little sense to me Um, and because it made little sense to me, it made a little sense to me then, it makes little sense to me now, I was more subject to, well, this is stupid and it's bullshit. You found, you found a justification in your mind right. to, to make it. Exactly. Right. All right. So now I just want to get into, um, here's a guy, Gordon, that we're talking to this whole time that didn't just make it. Like, like I said, I grew up in a neighborhood, <laughs> organized crime. Like there was Gotti, right? There was the big boss. You were like 50,000 feet above him. You had uh, well, one of I the never biggest. Killed anybody, you, you had the, one of the biggest law firms in the country. Uh, your it's coach, one of the ones. yeah, your co-chair of like uh, ranked the number one deal maker in the country. You got tremendous clients. Your daughter's killing it in tennis, right? You got the picture perfect life, and um, you lose everything like in a moment's notice. You fucking the legs get taken out from under you. I had just met you. Or maybe I just met you right around... No, we, the, I met you afterwards. I met you right afterwards, and... Um, I met you probably a month afterwards. And to me, by the way, no big deal. I met so many people that went to jail, and, and like... <laughs> I was just another one. <laughs> just another guy going to jail. Matter of fact, you've only got a 30-day bid, I think. It was, it was 28 it, days. 28 days. But... And it wasn't like you killed somebody. So for me, it was, uh, you know, here's a great guy that clearly fucked up, and... and um, and that's what, you know, the whole Spartan philosophy is like, you got to be resilient. Like, I, I, wasn't, I wasn't as excited that you were successful, picture perfect and everything before. Um, I was excited to see what happens after. Does he bounce back? Right? Does, does that person that um, fails the death race here on the farm come back the next year and try again? Well, the first thing I'd say is I'm probably not going to do the death race. But because uh, that might be tougher than anything else. Uh, Look, that's still a story being written, right? Have I bounced back? I do know that after I got arrested, I got arrested on uh, March 12th, uh, 2019, uh, seven days before my 53rd birthday. Um, I was, you're right, I was the co-chairman of a fantastic, and they're still a fantastic, uh, one of the best in the world, especially for what I did, uh, law firms terrific people built uh, I think one of the largest practices in my area in in the country if not the world Uh, loved the people there uh, still do Uh, great colleagues surrounded by brilliant people great reputation uh, ironclad uh, sat on boards gave money uh, worked with all sorts of folks at all sorts of ends of the spectrum was doing all sorts of stuff that I really enjoyed and I was miserable and that was the little secret behind it I was not I was living something that uh, I was supposed to be not what I really was I again I kept chasing that drug and the drug was okay uh, get into law school make law review, write a law review article, graduate top of your class, get into a great law firm, make partner, uh, uh, build a practice, get on the executive committee of the law firm, which is a law firm thing, Uh, be named, get a big title at the law firm, get on boards, all of that. It was just one after the other. And it wasn't that I was tired from it because I never got tired. I was 
It just wasn't, there was no happiness in it. Then March 12th, the morning of March 12th, I got a call from an FBI agent, wakes me up, comes in like ready to storm Tora Bora. Uh, I, in the back of a car with my hands behind my back. Wait, and stop, stop there. Do you know at that point, they, they tell you what, what it's no, for? No, they wouldn't tell me what it was for, but I, I had figured it out. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> and not allowed to make a call when they come get you at the house. Uh, wife, she's with you. What, what, tell me, get into that. Uh, it, I, I was able to make a call. Um, and, uh, I called a lawyer. I called my wife. Um, but I knew it was, I was, it was over. Um, and the first line of what I've written is, is from that morning, which all I could say is, and I guess because I don't have better vocabulary, was, I'm fucked. I know I'm totally fucked. Everything. Your life passes before your eyes and mythology and all. It wasn't that my life passed before my eyes. It was like my life was over. Everything before that moment no longer mattered. So now it was all new. It was all like those, I was all born things, again. All those things you just described, going to the great school, getting gone. Meaningless. Right. Totally meaningless. 53 years, gone. Gone. Poof. Done. And I knew it. Because just you don't survive this. And so then you take out the... And the most important thing you have in life, which I used to tell students about, I used to tell young associates about, is your integrity, your reputation... Um, your credibility and I blew it over nothing By the and way, I all, knew it of all the people out there the 53 people that got busted you, you should have known better than anybody yes right yeah I, there's no excuse for what right. I did um, so yes I think that's true so the key I think was am I going to survive this am I physically going to survive this not you know somebody gonna shoot me but am am i gonna take myself off the field and that was with me for a very long time because how did you i spent my entire life building up a persona i might not have been happy with it but that was my persona and it's gone it was gone and i was like okay i'm done i don't want any part of this I'm out. Plus, you're, you're, you're in, in, your, in your child's eyes, in your mind, you completely f*** them over. You look like an idiot to them. Like, yep. you could probably get away with looking like an idiot to your friends. Tough with your kids. It was very tough with my kids. Um, uh, but then you get that aw- awesome answer from your daughter when you uh, call uh, her. Yeah, and my father, who, yeah, I was like the, his pride of my terrific son did all this great stuff. It was all meaningless. In a flash, it was meaningless. And uh, I, I thought very long and hard about just, Ending that's it. it, I'm done. Ending it. Like the death racer that doesn't come back. <laughs> Correct. They take the death part of it very seriously. Uh, <laughs> no, but, but it wasn't, I mean, this is the whole lesson with Spartan is if it's not fatal, it's no big deal. But the fatality of it was up to me, right? And I struggled with that um and there were a few people family definitely but there were a few people uh who called me that day the next day some of the people you know yeah. richard baker yeah I, I don't want to break down but there were a few people uh a guy named mike triplett my my closest friend another very close friend named uh, ratmir timishev uh, they called me the next day and said you fucked up now what and they were right there they're not holding my hand and not treating me like a baby or saying oh we feel so bad there was no sympathy there was okay now what that community is big it, it was huge, right. and it really shows who your true friends who your are. Friends are, yeah. And uh, I don't know what, if anything, I ever did to deserve that kind of friendship. But it wasn't just one phone call it, from them. It was repeated. Okay, so you're going to keep whining about this. You, you're going to you're going to let your family down again. You're going to, uh, or, or you're going to pick yourself up. And encouragement. And but for those people, frankly, meeting you, Joe. I didn't know you. 
I met you through Richard, who's just an extraordinary entrepreneur. Um, you right away sort of took to it. And everything well, I, was, I saw I was that excited. you were building. I was like, hey, listen, I got a lot of guys that went to jail. Let me um, get you lessons <laughs> so you can get through yeah, the but they, they went to jail for real, for, for good reasons, not real, for good reasons. I went to jail for something so incredibly stupid. I guess yeah. you only, you only go to jail. Everybody's got to go to jail if they fuck up. Um, so that's what kept me alive and kept me going. Yeah. Um, so to that extent, I'm on the other side of that. Uh, hey, for those of you going through some tough time in life, what I, I was sending, I remember now, I was sending you um, pictures of folks in our ecosystem and the Spartan ecosystem that yeah, are missing legs were. and arms and, and uh, paralyzed and still, still fired up and saying, this is what we do. We do it anyway. And, um, and so then it puts it in perspective, I think, for somebody like you that says, all right, come on, dust off. You sent me a video clip. Yeah, it was a promotional video clip, but it was so cool. And it had this great soundtrack. I forget what it was from. But there was a, um, a woman who had just gone through cancer and was just divorced. Yeah. And she's on, like, at the top of the... I think it was the top of this right mountain. Here, yeah, she's wearing... Yeah. I just remember this. Um, she's wearing, like, a, a white T-shirt that's sort of bloodied and, and wet. And, and she says, I needed this. I really needed this. And that it was shortly after, you know, I'm just coming out of, oh, my God, it's what do thing. I do? Um, so it was, like, six weeks in, April, May. I said... She could do it. I, I got to do this. Yeah. And believe me, I thought about, and I'm sure there are a lot of people out there who think about these things of ending it. And that would have been the most selfish goddamn thing I could have done. Yeah. I had already done so much damage. How can I do that? Um, to my father, to my kids, to my family. Um, it, it's just... So many more stories to uh, to create. There's so much more time, right? Like, yeah. you would have ended it. Yep. But you're here. And we're glad he's here. We'll be right back to this interview, but first a message from today's sponsor, Doorlane. You know that knee pain can really slow you down. Sometimes that knee pain is due to osteoarthritis, a disease that affects some 14 million Americans. Learn about osteoarthritis knee pain and how to alleviate it at oaneepainrelief.com. You'll find information there about non-surgical, non-opioid treatments for osteoarthritis knee pain that may help delay the need for knee surgery. One treatment you'll find there is Doralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months of relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. It's indicated for the treatment of mild to moderate osteoarthritis knee pain when conservative treatments have not worked. Risks can include general knee pain, and pain at the injection site. Full prescribing information is at doorlane.com. Spartans say no to limits. You can learn more at oaneepainrelief.com. That's oaneepainrelief.com. One more thing. We have pulled together some of the most powerful moments in Spartan Up podcast history, and we've put them all together on one page. You can find it at spartan.com slash tough Bible. Okay, back to the interview. All right, we are talking about jail time. Um, I remember the day you went in. Yep. How was you it? You sent me a message. I the, sent you a message. Morning, yeah. yeah. How was it? Uh, it sucked. Uh, and anybody well, I mean, were you nervous as hell going in? Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, look, prison, jail, whatever confinement. There's nothing good about it. And uh, some people talk about oh, club fed, and there's jails for rich people or for white collar criminals. Having your freedom taken away when you've grown up free um buying it if you're in a luxury apartment in and of itself is a major change having your your freedom taken away being uh, totally demolished as uh, from what you were before and then being in a true prison and there's nothing nice i don't care what anybody says there's nothing nice or pleasant about prison nothing so I was in a, a what's called a prison camp. So uh, for either nonviolent uh, felons, this is a federal prison camp, or for people who were violent, originally arrested on uh, violent charges, but then sort of graduated to the camp because of good behavior over many, many years uh, in uh, more secure facilities. 
So most of the guys I was in with, um, there were 90 guys, uh, the majority of them were for drugs um, uh, and fraud. I'd say the majority were fra- was drugs, some fraud. Uh, there was not a lot of rich people walking around on insider trading. I, I don't think there were any, frankly. It was mainly gang members, people who were sort of born into the business. Um, some with weapons charges, some not. But mainly drugs and petty type fraud schemes or tax schemes. And I don't know everybody's case and you don't really ask about their cases. It's just not something you do. Everybody's guilty. We were all guilty. There were some people in there still fighting, but the overwhelming, and I'm not saying that I can't side their case, but we all did something. Um, And the question is, okay, now what? Uh, I was only there for 28 days. The guy in the bunk across from me, and it's one big open bunk like camp, bunk beds. Um, The guy across from me had been in for 27 years. His last arrest was on less than five grams of crack. Um, They called him OG for old gangster. Uh, I didn't even know his full name. He was he was institutionalized. No getting out ever total wasted life that this institution had done to him and he did to himself as a younger man and what you see is a system just which is yes I was a lawyer but I was a corporate transactional lawyer I really didn't pay much attention to the criminal justice system you see a system that's just built for failure and recidivism if you want to make somebody a criminal put them in prison it's it's, it's like um, you want to make somebody a terrorist, put them in with a bunch of other terrorists. It is a, it is a criminal system for criminals. Well, how would you change it? Uh, first of all, with real education. Second of all, uh, well, maybe this would be the first of all. I wouldn't put so many people in prison. We just overcriminalize everything in this country. Most of the people there were not that I met. Those 90 guys were there for drugs and fraud. Assuming you want to keep all those drugs illegal and people who are sort of born into the business, you want to penalize them for doing it because that, that's the policy, fine. But do you want to just create warehouses of human beings because they were born into a system where the drug trade is part of the industry that they're surrounded by? Is that really what's good for society? Um, and then you put them into a situation surrounded by other people in that same trade uh, with no ability to get any skills. The only things that were taught, other than that were taught by the inmates themselves, the only things that were taught that I know of, that I saw, were um, how to be a physical trainer, uh, or uh, there were some people who were doing automotive um, care. Uh, that's it. So you wanted to do uh, learn uh, computer coding. You wanted to it's learn re- marketing. <clears throat> That's ridic- no. That seems like a, a, an easy fix, right? Education, education, education. But it's, so the education was, I, I taught a class four days a week on sort of how to start a business and financial literacy and stuff. The, it, it wasn't because my class was so brilliant. It was just the, the hunger for anything. They want to learn. They just, they showed up. So there's 90 guys. I'd had 15 to 20 more guys at every, every single class and plenty of guys we're just sitting there watching TV all day. Plenty. The two things that are absolutely true ab- about prison is TV's on all the time, and the food is the worst garbage in the world. Right. So there's, you're, you're being stuffed with shit food. So get rid of the TV, more education, and better food. No, it's, it's not enough. First of all, don't have so many people incarcerated. I think the statistic is that a third of this country, so over 100 million people, have either been incarcerated or are closely related to somebody who's wow, been incarcerated. Big number. That's ridiculous. That's a ridiculous. Number. We are over criminalizing or at least over sentencing people. I was in there with guys who, um, and most of the sentencing is based on dollar values. So I was in there with guys who were involved in schemes that may have had millions of dollars involved. It doesn't mean people actually lost millions of dollars. But if you have millions of dollars involved in a scheme, even if people didn't lose millions of dollars, that could be 20 years. Wow. You're not getting out of that. Yeah. And that's the sentencing guidelines. 
So the real issue is there's just too many people in prison. It's not helpful to them. It's certainly not helpful to uh, uh, society. And recidivism rates are 70%. I bet yeah. I, I don't have much of a recidivism rate here, but people don't want to come back to, uh, <laughs> to the stuff I do. So this is Man, worse than prison. This is worse than prison. <laughs> what? See, the difference is they know they could leave. <laughs> what? Um, actually, we had a kid. I'll tell you a funny story. We had a kid here last year. Uh, very, very, very wealthy parents uh, sent them here, and um, I had to run away for a day. I was on Joe Rogan's podcast that day, and I get a text. He's trying to escape. <laughs> he stopped. He stopped a car on the road on Route 100, and said, "I'm being held here against my will." <laughs> he tried to get in the car and leaves. I don't know how free people are when they're on the farm, but but what's next? Um, so it's rebuilding. Uh, I mean, to quote somebody you mentioned, Lance Armstrong, it's all about forward. Uh, admitting, look, I spent a lot of time admitting to myself. And to others, uh, what I did, and that it was wrong, and that there's no excuse for it. Um, but then building back, uh, so I built a new business, uh, working with a lot of the people that I worked with before. I'm not a lawyer. Uh, don't pretend to be a lawyer. Don't want to be a lawyer. Uh, I loved what I did, but that's in the past now. Um, working on businesses, helping uh, people build, restructure, fix, buy, um, sell, put together businesses. Um, Two of the people that work with me, for me, um, uh, were in the system. Uh, I want to hire more people like that. Um, We're up to six people now. Uh, A large part of what we do is working with organizations that uh, help people that are in the system get out. We just started a a small fund um, called the prison uh, the prison visitation fund, uh, which is live. We've had our first uh, uh, s- set of grants, and that's for it, it's incredibly important to keep people connected while they're in prison to their families. A lot of people in prison are indigent, uh, most, um, and their families can't afford to travel. So just getting a bus ticket and having a place to stay. So we're paying for that. Uh, the charities that I worked with beforehand, I'm working with again, um, uh, thank God, uh, helping, it, which oddly enough, were mainly educational charities, uh, helping uh, kids that really need the help um, from the worst schools in New York uh, get to some semblance of hopefully graduating their public high schools and hopefully going on to college. Uh, uh, and I'm very proud to say that we've helped three now, at least three people, uh, get out early um, that were just way over sensed. Awesome. Including one that we got um, a guy named Kyle Komodo. I hope he doesn't mind me using his name, but it's public. Uh, he got on the clemency list uh, for on Trump's clemency list right at the end. Uh, I got word about it three weeks before the end of Trump's term. And we got to work, and Kyle has, I believe, 10 children uh, from Utah. Got caught up in a scam in his early 20s, a marketing scam. Um, Shouldn't have done it, but was sentenced to 27 years. Wow. 27 years. And still had at least, I think, 12 years on his... And we got him clemency. Because in prison, he did everything he was supposed to do. He took classes. He tried to stay connected to his family. Never had a, a, a misconduct charge against him. No money. So that's what we're doing. It happens to all of us. It happens to the best of us. Otherwise, there wouldn't be 100 million people connected to prisons in some way, shape, or form. What advice uh, would you give to folks so that we don't trip and fall from grace? Uh, well, look, again, always lead with integrity. And if you know it's wrong, just don't do it. Uh, nothing's worth it. Nothing. Uh, that's simple advice. It's also, uh, in a way, condescending advice because that's very simple to say um, from the outside. You don't know the intricacies of what's going on in a family situation uh, or a business situation. And 
again, we are fallible creatures, right? Um, we're programmed to be fallible. So all the high-minded words and uh, all the judgmental crap that we, we that's out there, and this country is extremely judgmental um, and pure puritanical in that way which is you you screwed up so you're never forgiven my real advice is let's assume you do fail right not everybody's going to fail and go to prison but let's say you do fail publicly and the reality is the more you achieve the more likely it is that something that can go wrong that can be um painful Uh, and deemed a failure, either in the media or in the law um, or both, Uh, business-wise, family-wise, divorces, all that stuff. The most important thing, I think, is don't make it worse. So first, do no harm. Don't make it worse. The instinct to fight it is, especially for people who've been fighting their whole lives and that's what people hired me for was to be their advocate to be a fighter for them you gotta push back on that instinct if you did something wrong own it really own it and try as much as you can to learn from it Um, that's my first piece of advice second piece of advice is you got to find a way to forgive yourself now, that, that assumes you are a reasonably centered person. I'm sure there are people out there, I know there are people out there, that don't have that for whatever reason, uh, physiologically, and they don't, they don't have that capability. But assume you're a reasonably centered person who stepped off, who screwed up. Um, get back to that center and realize that there's a way forward. Uh, that requires reaching out to people and talking to them uh, quickly before you make it worse. That's my advice. My other advice is uh, don't take this whole college thing so goddamn seriously. Parents out there, it's your kids, basically if you've raised reasonably good kids um, because of them or because of you or because of both, most likely you've done great. Whether they go to Harvard or they go to the state school or they go to no college if they're good people and are willing to work reasonably hard they're going to be fine so long as they're healthy raise good citizens correct you're the man thanks joe thanks for coming thank you we've been collecting data for years and now there's a book that contains all these insights it's called 10 rules for resilience mental toughness for families and it's written by joe DeSena, along with his co-author dr laura pence Learn to be more resilient and to create a more resilient, grittier, stronger, happier, healthier family. Go to Spartan.com slash 10 rules. That's the number 10. Spartan.com slash 10 rules to find out more and pre-order now. This episode of Spartan Up is brought to you by Duralane, a single injection that may provide up to six months relief from osteoarthritis knee pain. Risks can include general knee pain and pain at the injection site. You can see full prescribing information at Duralane.com. 